What's up boys and girls, Craig Lopez back once again with another tutorialism and today we're going to be doing a complete beginner's guide to Cubase 11. In just 60 minutes we'll be going from a blank template to this. Explaining every step along the way. I will be using Cubase 11 Pro, but every instrument and effect that I use along the way is available in both Cubase Artist and Cubase Elements, so you can follow along regardless of which version you're using. Of course we will be utilising some of the new features in Cubase 11, the new Scale Assistant, the new Perfect Pitch Bend features, the new Sampler and the insanely brilliant new plugin Squasher. Now I will put a list of the chapters in the timestamps in the description below if you want to come back and reference any of this or if you're already familiar with some of these features from a previous version and just want to skip ahead. If this is your first time on the channel, a big welcome to one and all and you might want to consider hitting that subscribe button for more Cubase content in the future. But anyway, that's enough of an intro for one day, let's get into this. So when you open up Cubase 11, you'll be greeted by this, the Steinberg Hub. On the left hand side, you can see we have all the latest news and tutorials from Steinberg, as well as links to deals, user manuals, forum and support. And on the right hand side, we have a whole bunch of template projects, as well as a list of your most recent projects. But for now, we're going to create an empty project. I would always recommend having a dedicated folder just for your Cubase projects, as I have here. I would also recommend setting up a new folder for every project you begin. The Cubase workspace is made up of four zones. The left, right and lower zones can be hidden or viewed by clicking on these icons in the top right hand corner. and the upper zone is always visible. At the very top of the workspace we have our toolbar and at the very bottom our transport bar. Our Cubase's workspace is highly customizable so if yours looks a little different from mine don't panic. Most elements can be hidden or viewed by clicking on any of these cogwheels. Other elements can be expanded or shrunk wherever you see these three little dots. Now before we get started we want to make sure that Cubase and our sound card are communicating properly with each other. To do that we're going to go up to the menu, select studio and go down to studio setup, select audio system and select your sound card from the drop down menu. And click OK. Now we also want to make sure that our inputs and outputs are rooted correctly so we can record incoming audio and hear the audio output. So to do that we're going to go up to studio again, go to audio connections, under input, make sure you have the correct audio card selected and under outputs, make sure you have your audio card selected again. Now setting up your MIDI controller will be hardware specific so you'll have to check with your user manual on how to set that up. But once that is set up to test whether Cubase is receiving the income of MIDI Click on the cogwheel in the bottom right hand corner. Make sure input output activity is checked and you will see this box down here. Press a key on your keyboard and you should see the meter respond. Okay so let's create a MIDI instrument. To do that we're going to go to the main workspace and right click in this area select add instrument. I'm going to create a Halion Sonic SE instrument 
To find that in your list, click on the drop down menu and in the search bar, type Halion and click on Halion Sonic SE and click add track. We can now see that an instrument track has been loaded into our arranger window with a Halion Sonic SE loaded into it. The instrument can be viewed or hidden by clicking on this icon here. or click in this icon here in the inspector. We go down to our law zone and select mix console. We can see we also have a mixer channel named Halion Sonic. Now to keep things nice and tidy, I always like to separate my stereo in and stereo out channels from my instrument and audio channels. To do that, I'm going to click in the law zone to highlight it. And then in the left hand zone, click visibility and to the bottom click on zones and then click these buttons to the right the first one will move the stereo input to the right hand side and if we open up the drop down menu we can also move the stereo out to the right if we highlight the lower zone once more we can increase or decrease the width of the channels by pressing g or h on our keyboard Let's increase those for now. Okay, let's select a piano sound in Halion Sonic. We can do this by selecting piano in the category section. And now in the lower section of Halion Sonic SE, we should see a list of all the pianos we have available. The number of sounds available to you will be different depending on whether you're running Cubase Pro, Cubase Artist, or Cubase Elements. But I'm just going to select this Yamaha S90 ES piano by double clicking and with my Halion channel selected in the arrange view and record enable selected I should be able to hear the instrument by pressing the keys on my keyboard okay so let's hide the instrument for now and I'm going to begin this track as I begin every track and that is with a chord progression and for this we're going to use a Cubase's chord pads the chord pads can be found in the lower zone by clicking on this tab. If you don't see this tab, click on the cog and make sure chord pads is checked. The layout of your chord pads may look different from mine. To change the layout, click on this cog, go to pad layout and choose your preferred layout from the drop down menu. Click OK. Now Cubase's chord pads allow us to play chords with either a single click of the mouse or by pressing a single key on your MIDI keyboard. The keys on your keyboard which will trigger the chord pads are highlighted in blue here. Now there's a whole bunch of chord pad presets to choose from. These can be selected by clicking on this box, selecting load chord pads preset, and single clicking any of the preset names. For now, I want to work with a blank template. To do that, I'm going to click on this drop down menu and select Unassign All Pads. So I'm going to right click in the first pad and select Assign Pad from MIDI Input and play an accord from my MIDI keyboard. And now, if I press C1 on my keyboard, you will hear it will trigger that G minor chord. Now I could of course assign each of these pads a chord in the exact same way, but for the remainder of my chord progression, I'm going to use the chord assistant, which can be found here. Now the chord assistant has two tabs, proximity and circle of fifths, but I'm going to stay with the circle of fifths for the purposes of this video. Now we can audition chords by clicking on the symbols,
And we can see that each of the chords in the G minor scale has a Roman numerical value attached to it. We can, of course, audition chords from outside the G minor scale to hear what they would sound like. But later on in the video, I want to show you the new scale assistant, and it doesn't seem to like borrowed chords too much. Not so important for now, but if anybody from Steinberg is watching this, it would be great if you could incorporate that into a future update. But anyway, let's play about and see if we can find a chord progression that we like. Okay, so I quite like that, so I'm just going to drag these chords into the chord pads. And now I can trigger all these chords from my MIDI keyboard. Okay, let's close the chord assistant for now. And let's see if we can give this progression a little bit more depth. So right now, each of these chords is just a basic triad. But we can scroll through tensions by clicking on these left and right arrows at the bottom of each pad. We can also edit the chords by clicking on the arrow to the left of each pad. And we can adjust the voicings by clicking on the arrows to the right of the pad. Okay, so I'm happy with that. Let's record that in. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up a loop region. To do that, I'm going to left click here and drag the cursor over four bars. When this section is highlighted in purple, it means our playhead is going to loop over that region. We can toggle loop on and off by clicking here or clicking on the activate cycle button in the transport bar. To the right of the transport bar, we can adjust the tempo of our track. I'm going to leave mine at 120 for now. And to the right of that, we have our metronome, which we can toggle on and off by clicking on the button. So if I press play now, we should hear our metronome counting at 120 BPM. Now I would like a two bar counting when I press record. So to set that up, we go to our menu and click on transport. Go to metronome setup. Under counting, we can set our number of bars and keep mine at two. And to hear the metronome during that counting, you have to have click during counting selected. Let's click OK. Go back to the beginning of the project and I'm going to press record. Press stop to end the recording. And now we can see we have a MIDI clip of what we've just performed. To hear that back, we can just press play. To zoom in, we can either use these sliders or the plus and minus buttons. And we can also scroll left and right using the scroll bar. Now I can hear in the recording that my timing was obviously off, as was the velocity range of which I was hitting the keyboard. So we can fix all that by entering the MIDI editor.
We can do that either by double clicking on the MIDI clip and we can see that our low zone has now changed to the key editor or we can simply select it from the tabs below. We can increase or decrease the size of the lower zone by clicking and dragging. And we have the same navigation options that we do in the arrange page. I also forgot to mention that we can navigate by moving our cursor up to the loop region until we see the four pointed cursor. And we can click and drag up and down to zoom in and out. And also move left and right by keeping our mouse held down. The same applies for the arranger page. In the editor we can move notes about by clicking and dragging either single notes or a group of notes. Ctrl Z will undo. We can change the length of each note by clicking and dragging either the left or the right hand side of the note. We right click, we can bring up our toolbar. We can draw in notes with the pencil. We can erase them with the eraser. We can trim them with the trimmer. Split them with the scissor tool. Blue notes together and mute notes. You can also use the delete key on your keyboard to erase notes. Now of course we could just drag each chord into its correct position, but I want to use the quantize function which will quantize all notes at the exact same time. Quantize settings can be found here in the editor, as well as here in the arrange page. The quantize amount can be set via the drop down menu, and you can see the grid in the editor change accordingly. So let's set mine to 1 8th, and if I press the Q button, it will apply that quantize. So let's have a listen to what we have now. So the timing is better, but the velocities are still a little bit off. We can see the velocities in the lower section of the editor. We can change the velocity by selecting an art and moving its velocity up or down. Or we can select the whole chord and move the velocity for all notes at the same time. But if we select all of the notes and hover our mouse over the highlight section, you see we have these three dots appear. The one in the top left will allow us to fade in the notes. The dot to the right will allow us to fade out. The dot in the middle will allow us to scale the velocities vertically. And the dot to the right in the middle will allow us to increase or decrease the dynamic range of those velocities. So I'm going to decrease the dynamic range, but still keep a little bit of variation and use the dot in the middle to bring the overall velocity of everything up. So now let's have a listen. That sounded a lot better, but I think I want these chords to be played a little bit more legato. So I'm just going to click in the middle of the editor to deselect all of the notes. And then in the left hand pane, I'm going to go to Inspector. So I'm going to go over to Length, click on the drop down arrow. Now if you don't see Length appear here, you can just click on the cog and make sure you have Length ticked. And to apply Legato, I'm just going to click on Apply Legato. I think I want a little bit of a gap between each of these chords, just so it sounds a little bit more natural. So to do that, I'm going to go to Scale Legato and pull this slider back a touch. And let's have a listen.
Okay, so that's sounding a lot better now. So the next thing I want to do is select a scale for our track. I'm going to do that by using Cubase 11's new scale assistant. So that can be found in the inspector up here under scale assistant. Again, if you don't see that, click on the cog and make sure you have it selected. Now, in order for Scale Assistant to recognize the notes in the key editor, you must have the Record and Editor button enabled. And we can see under Scale Suggestion, from the chords that I've played, Cubase is suggesting four scales. So if we click on the drop-down menu, you can see it's suggesting either A-sharp major, G Aeolian, or natural minor, or C Blues 1. And for some reason, it's suggesting G, A, all in natural minor twice. I guess it really wants me to pick that as my scale, so I'm going to click on it. And now we can see in editor scale, G, A, all in natural minor is now selected. So there's a few interesting things we could do from here. So right now, if we look at the grid in our scale editor, all of the white parts of the grid correspond to the white notes on the keyboard and all of the dark gray parts correspond to the black notes on the keyboard. Now if we go to show scale note guides and click on it, now all of the white grid boxes represent the notes that are in our scale of G minor, and all of the dark gray ones represent the notes that are not in our scale. If we click snap pitch editing, now if I want to enter a new note, It won't allow me to enter a note that is not in our scale. And if we go to snap live input, it will snap every note I play on my keyboard into G minor, regardless of what note I'm playing. Okay, so let's go back to our range window. And let's label this part by a double click in here. Now this is labeled our channel. If we want the MIDI part to have the same name as our channel, we can just shift and enter as we enter the name. If we want the clip to have a different name with the clip selected, we can just click in here and enter a different name. If you don't see this info line, just click on the cog and have info line selected. And if you don't see the option for name, click on the cog in the info line and make sure you have name selected. So now is probably a good time to save our project. So to do that, go file, save as, and in the folder that we set up at the beginning, let's give our project a name. So just as in the key editor, we can right click to select our toolbar. And with the MIDI clip, we can cut parts up, delete parts, glue parts together, mute parts, etc. Let's control Z and go back to our original part. And what I want to do now is change the piano patch into something that's going to be a little bit more inspirational for this track that we're working on. So I'm going to open up the instrument and under category I'm going to go to synth comp and if I double click on a part we can hear that that sound is now changed to that particular patch <laughs> so let's scroll through some of these until I find one that I like I'm going to go with this Juanita sequence. Just beneath the patch selection in Halion Sonic, we have these macro controls which allow us to manipulate the sound. Let's have a play about with some of those. cool but I think I'm just going to leave it like that just for now. 
and I'm going to rename my channel and part. Okay, so let's add a baseline. So I'm going to close Halion Sonic, right click in this section, go to add instrument, and I'm going to select prologue. So click on the drop down menu, and in the search bar, type in prologue. I'm going to click in this top section to bring up the presets. Select bass. And I'm going to go with this axe. Let's close the instrument for now. Right click to bring up a toolbar. And select the pencil. And I'm going to click and drag over the four bars to create a new empty MIDI part. Go down into our editor, make sure record and editor is enabled. And we can see that the settings in our scale assistant have carried over from our chord track. And because I have snap live input enabled, so now as I attempt to jam out a bass line, all notes will be locked to G minor. Let's change our quantize value to sixteenths and quantize that. Let's increase the velocity of the second note here. Let's name our part. So I'm thinking it might sound nice if we glide between these three notes and between these three notes. So first up, I want to see how many semitones between G1 and F2. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm going to open up the instrument and at the top where it says a pitch bend range. Let's change that to the nearest value, which is a 12. And let's extend the view of the editor and bring up the lower section where the velocity is held. And where it says velocity, I'm going to click and change that to pitch bend. Underneath pitch bend, I'm going to click on this icon, which says snap a pitch bend to events. And right now we can see our pitch bend range is plus two and negative two. And click on set up grid and change that to plus 12. So it's the same as our instrument. I'm going to change the loop range. So we're just going over the first bar. I'm going to zoom in so we can more accurately see what we're doing here. I'm going to stretch this note out. And mute these two notes. Go back to my pencil tool. Add a note here. And let's go up 10. And then from F2 to D2 is down 1, 2, 3. So add another note here and go down 1, 2, 3. And add a node in the center here. And at the end of our note, let's go back down to 0. Let's just have a listen to that to make sure it sounds right. I didn't change the loop markers. Let's go back and change that. There we go. Add another node here. And click on this little circle icon. Let's change this to a slide. Add another node here again. Move this one across and change this to a slide. See how that sounds. Let's have a listen to that. Nice. So we can delete these notes now that we don't need them. Let's do the same in the later section. Let's have a listen. So I'm gonna switch back to velocity and just raise the velocity of that first note. But I can see, even with just two instruments loaded, that I am clipping the output. And I can see that 
because I have a little red bar here. If you don't see this, again, click on the cog and make sure you have input output selected. Now, if I go over to my mix console, I can indeed see that the stereo output has been clipping because it is lit up red. I can reset that by clicking on it. Let's bring down the size of the lower zone here. Now I can of course increase or decrease the volume of my channels by moving the faders up and down. Double click and press zero to reset. But usually I don't play about with the volume faders until I'm at my mix down stage. So what I'm going to do instead is decrease the pre-gain on each of the channels. So to do that, I'm going to click on this E button, which is the edit channel settings. This can be accessed from the channel view or from the arrange view. And in the EQ section, you can see we have a pre-gain dial. Now, if you have sliders here and not dials, these can be changed by clicking on this cog and changing the view to show sliders or show knobs. Of course, it's up to you what your preference is. I'm going to solo just the synth chords by pressing S for solo. And then I'm going to reduce the pre-gain. And then I'm going to do the same for the bass channel. Now, of course, the overall output is going to be lower. So I'm personally going to compensate for that just by raising the output of my speakers. You don't have to worry about that on YouTube because I will increase the volume in the edit. Now the reason I'm doing this is because it's always important to have headroom on your stereo out. You never want that clipping because that can lead to digital distortion and nobody wants that. Okay, so let's get rid of that annoying metronome sound and add some drums. Now I have been adding instruments by right clicking and adding instruments. But we can also add instruments from our right hand panel. So to do this, we need to go to the media tab. That's not selected, just select it. And go to VST Instruments. Let's minimize this. And what I want is Groove Agent SE. So I'm just going to type in Groove into the search bar. Grab my Groove Agent SE and just drag it into the project. To get to the drums in Groove Agent, you just click on this folder and all the drum kits you have available will be in this section here. Again, like I say, I'm in Cubase Pro, so if you're an artist or element, you will have different drum kits available to you. But under style, I'm going to select Electronica Dance. And to load up a kit, you just double click. And now if you press a pad, you will be able to hear the loaded kit. Each pad also has a corresponding MIDI note, so you can of course trigger these with your MIDI controller. I'm going to scroll down and select this drum and bass kit. We can of course play in a drum pattern using our MIDI keyboard or enter one using our mouse. What I'm going to do is click on this pattern button and now each of these pads has a MIDI pattern loaded into it and those MIDI patterns will trigger the drum hits in the instrument. So if I click on a pad, we can hear that pattern. And I can record that in as MIDI. Which we can see here. But in this case, I would actually like to see the MIDI patterns in my project so we can edit them further. So I'm going to delete this. Open up my instrument. Pull this down. And what we can do is just drag these into our project. Let's minimize the project so we can see these a bit more. to label these and give each of them a different color so I can differentiate them a little bit easier. So to do this, select the clip, go up to the color palette and choose the color. 
Now your colour palette will probably look a little bit different from mine, but like I say, Cubase is so highly customizable, and I have a customised colour palette. So I want to extend my synth chords and my bass line. So to do that, you can just hover your mouse over the MIDI clip, and put your mouse over the centre square, click and drag. Going to extend the loop length, and then using my scissor tool, I'm going to chop up these drum parts. I want to repeat this first groove, so I'm going to highlight it, hold down Alt on my keyboard, and you can see the icon change to scissors. I'm going to left click and drag, and I can duplicate the part over. Let's turn off my metronome and see how that sounds. And now let's say I want to edit that drum pattern further. I can double click and you can see we have the drum pattern in the key editor, but Cubase also has a second MIDI editor specifically designed for drums. And to access that, just click on this arrow and go to drum editor. Now the drum editor is different from the key editor in a few different ways. I'm not going to dive into it too in depth right now, but let's just start with the obvious. First of all, we don't have note lengths because they're irrelevant when we're using drum hits and they're in one shot mode. Secondly, we can see the velocity on a per note basis, as opposed to seeing all the velocities for everything as we do in the key editor. And finally, for now, we can change the grid for each individual note, should we need to. We can also audition each note by clicking in this section here. Now we can see that the instruments are labelled according to their general MIDI norm, but I want these labelled according to the instrument I have loaded in. So to do this, I'm going to click in the Arrange page, and in this section here where it says Drum Map, I'm going to select Create Drum Map from Instrument. And now we can see that the instrument is labelled according to whatever we have on these drum pads. So right now the only drum instruments we can see are the ones that have MIDI information on them. If we want to reveal them all, we can click here and go to show drum sounds in use by instrument. And that will show us all of the pads with instruments on. So let me minimize this. And find a crash. So I think I would like a crash on the first beat of the first bar after that drum fill. Let's do that, right click select a drumstick and just enter a crash and I think at the beginning of bar 5 I would like that ride symbol in so I'm going to enter that put it at the beginning of the bar Let's label this part drums and let's give the channel a color. Move the drums up to the top and the bass second and let's give the bass a different color which we can also do here. Now I'm thinking that that bass, lovely as it is, might have some problems coming through on smaller speakers. So what I'm going to do is duplicate this bass channel. Let's glue these parts together. Double click to open up the editor. I'm going to select all of these MIDI notes. Hold down shift on my keyboard and press the up arrow, which is going to move all of these notes up by one octave. Pull this down and let's call this high bass. Let's just solo the two bass instruments so we can balance the level between them. I'm pulling down the gain on the high bass. Let's 
mute that so you can hear the difference. Cool. And I'm going to go back to the mix console, change the color of the high bass. I'm going to select the main bass, hold down shift and select the high bass. Right click and select add group channel to select the channels. I'm going to call this bass group. And what this is going to do is route the output of these two bass channels into this one bass group. And then the output of this bass group is what has been sent to the stereo output. And what this means basically is I have one fader which will lower the volume of both basses. And of course, I've got one pre-gain which will do the same thing. Okay, so let's have a look at adding some audio. So let's zoom out on this. Remove Groove from our search bar. Click on the back button up here. And let's go to Loops and Samples. In the search bar, I'm going to type in percussion. And now all of the percussion samples that come in my version of Cubase are listed below. To audition a sample, you just click on it and press play. Ah, okay, so I'm not hearing anything. And the reason for that is because of how I have my output routed. So I'm going to go up to Studio, go up to Audio Connections. And instead of having my sound card set to my outputs, I'm going to set it to control room, go down to monitor, and set my audio card to my monitor. Now I will be able to monitor these samples. We can change the preview level by moving the slider up and down. We can have it so the samples will loop around by clicking on this button here. We can have it so the samples will auto play as we select the next one on the list. This next button makes the samples play in time with our current project. And the final button will only play the samples when we press play on our transport bar. Okay, so I thought I was going to have to spend a while going through all these percussion samples, but I really like the way that that one sounds. So to get it into our project, just click and drag. Now you do want to make sure that all these buttons are now deselected, otherwise the samples will keep previewing as you're playing through your project. So let's have a listen to that. So of course, I want to pull down the gain on that. Make it sit right with everything else. And we can cut, mute, and repeat this audio clip the same way as we do with MIDI clips. Move it underneath the drums. Okay, so I think I want to add some kind of pluck element. So I'm going to type in pluck. Let's try this one. Might work, might not. Let's give it a go. Let's zoom out and I'm going to right click and add a sampler track. Let's call this pluck. And now you can see in the lower zone, we have a Cubase 11's new sampler. So we're going to get this pluck, drag it into the sampler. Now we can see in the title of the sample that this pluck is playing an F. So under root key, let's change that to F. And now I should be able to play the sample like I can any other instrument. Let's 
pull the pluck down below the synth chords and I'm going to go to my chord pads. Now I would like these plucks to play something rhythmical. So to do that I'm going to click on the E button, go to player modes and the drop down menu. I'm going to select pattern and then click on import MIDI loop. And if I single click on one of these and then hold down one of the chord pads. We can hear that that MIDI loop is now playing the chord on that chord pad. Okay, so I'm going to start going through these until I find one that fits a little bit better. Okay, so I think I'm going to go with this 1984 crew retro bells. Sounds like this. Let's try recording that in. Cool, let's quantize that. Shorten it and repeat. I'm going to go into the sample editor and I'm going to change the quality from standard to vintage. So that it's going to emulate an old 12-bit sampler. And if we just solo that so we can hear it. You can just hear us adding a little bit of grit. So let's have a look at how to record our own audio. So to do this, we need to right-click, go to Add Audio Track, select the audio input on your sound card, Choose whether you want that to be mono or stereo, and then choose the output routine, and then give it a name. I'm going to call this my bad voice, because that's what it's going to be. Now, because I have my microphone set up with my screen recording software, when I record my voice, I'm not going to be able to listen to the track at the same time, so I'm going to have to solo it. But when you're recording, of course, you'll be able to hear the track at the same time. So the first thing you want to do before you press record is make sure you're actually getting an input signal. So to do that, click on the monitor button and either talk into your mic or play your instrument. In my mind. Now that sounds a little bit weird because there is a slight delay between the input of your audio card and the monitoring in Cubase. So I would always advise that you do your monitoring via your sound card. I was just simply monitoring there just to make sure we have an incoming signal. And to record audio, it's just the same as recording MIDI. In my mind. Let's have a listen to how bad that was. In my mind. Okay, so it's all out of time. Let's zoom in on this. And I want the audio clip to start at the exact same time as my voice. So I'm going to drag this across. And to have finer control, Gonna hold down control. And have the clip start exactly where my voice comes in. And now I want to snap it exactly to a beat. So to do that, in the toolbar, make sure you have this icon selected. Snap to grid. And in the drop down menu, select grid. And then in the next menu, decide where you want that to snap to, whether it be to the nearest bar, to the nearest beat. Or like as I have it, adapt to zoom. So now when I drag this across, you can see the beginning of the clip has snapped exactly to where I wanted it to on the grid. Okay, so it's in time, but it's not sounding particularly great. So let's open up the edit channel. I'm going to click on channel strip. Turn the compressor on. Turn up the ratio. And I'm going to add a bit of compression to this. So I'm going to add a little bit of saturation. In my mind, in my mind, in my mind, in my mind. Go back to the EQ. And do a low cut. Going to add a little bit of delay on an insert. 
So click on the drop down menu, type in ping pong. I'm going to change the sync to eighth dotted. And let's play about with the mix and feedback. In my mind, 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 in my mind. On the send, I'm going to add a reverb by right clicking, go to add effects channel to send one, and let's go down to reverb. And let's get Roomworks SE. We call this Vocal Reverb. And we can see that that has now added a new FX channel. And if we open it up in the channel mixer, you can see the reverb is right there. So let's go back to the Bad Voice channel. And here we have the send amount, which is how much of this vocal is being sent to the reverb. Because the reverb is on a send channel, let's put the mix all the way up to 100% and let's have a listen. In my mind, in my mind, in my mind, in my mind. Okay, still sounded pretty terrible, but a little bit better. Also going to make sure that I have my audio clip selected. And in the info line, I'm going to go to transpose and I'm going to pitch my vocal down by clicking and dragging. In my mind, in my mind. Yeah, that's a bit much. Let's pull it up. In my mind. Okay, so I'm going to add a delay to that pluck and then show you how to automate that. So select the plug channel, insert, Steinberg, and let's go delay, and let's go with the multi-tap delay. Okay, so I just want to apologize for using that multi-tap delay. I didn't realize it wasn't available in all versions, but towards the end of the video, I replaced that with a delay that is available to all. I'm just going to solo the channel so we can hear what's going on. Change the sync. And I'm going to automate the feedback amount. Now, as a general rule of thumb, anything with a knob or a slider in in Cubase can be automated, and it's all done in the same way. You just hit on the W button, which stands for Write Automation. I'm going to take Loop Off, go back to the beginning of the project. And we don't need to press Record, we can just press Play. And let's move this down so we can see what's going on. Press Play. You can see an automation lane has appeared. So we take right off, but we leave R on, which stands for read, which is going to read the automation that we just recorded in. We take that off, the automation will no longer play back. Let's zoom in. I'll show you how we can edit automation. Very simple. We can move nodes about. If we click between two nodes, we should see a circle and we can create curves. We can delete nodes. I'll add them. Let's clean this up. And press delete on your keyboard as well to delete nodes if you have them highlighted. Bring that down there. Let's create one here and let's ramp that up slowly. And let's have a listen to that. I'll bring up the actual effect so you can see it move as well.
So let's have a look at some of the effects that I've used to really bring this beat to life. I'm not going to give a detailed description as to how to use each plugin, otherwise we'll be here for 60 hours, not 60 minutes. But I just want to show you what I've used and how I used it. So I put the drums and percussion into one group, which I've named Drum Bus, and that's just so I could automate a high pass filter and the resonance using the channel strips EQ towards the end of the 16 bars. And that sounds like this. On the bass group I added three effects. Before the effects it sounded like this. Firstly I added the distortion plugin. That sounds like this. Then I added a squasher. That makes it sound like this. And then I added some sidechain compression. To set this up first, I duplicated the Groove Agent SE channel and renamed it Sidechain. And then in this Sidechain channel, I deleted all the drum events apart from the kick drum. And then I opened up Cubase's compressor, clicked this button to activate the sidechaining. And then to the right of the button, hit the cog, clicked on Add Sidechain Source. And then from the drop down menu, I selected my Sidechain channel. I then opened up the mix console by going to studio, mix console, and then highlight the sidechain channel, and then under Rootin, change the output to no bus because I don't actually want to hear that kick drum. And now what's going to happen is every time that kick drum hits, instead of coming through the output, it's going to be fed into that compressor, and then the compressor will duck the bass whenever it's triggered by the sidechain. That sounds like this. And if I put that in with the drums, now we have a bit more room for our kick drum in the mix. On the chords channel, I added a chopper. Rotary. Some reverb. Auto pan, and of course a squasher. On the pluck channel, I adjusted the amp envelope to look like this and added a little bit of LFO2. And on the filter, I added some LFO1. In terms of effects, I added a chopper. Stereo delay. Vintage compressor. Stereo enhancer. Some sidechain compression. And finally, a squasher. I then added some vocal samples, which I got from this Bloom sample pack. They sound like this. To the vocals, I added some EQ, tube compressor, a squasher, of course, and a de -esser. On the send effects, I added Roomworks Reverb, Ping Pong Delay, and then after the Ping Pong Delay, 
I added some sidechain compression, but this time instead of being fed from the kick drum, it's actually being fed from the vocal itself, so that every time the vocal hits, it will compress the delay. On the stereo output, I added a touch of studio EQ, and of course, the squasher. And just as one final note, if you want to hear what your channel sounds like before and after all of the effects, you can just click on this button to deactivate and reactivate all of the effects. So let's have a listen to that on the master channel. So first I'll deactivate and then I'll toggle the studio EQ and the squasher on and off so you can hear the effect of that on everything. Okay, so that's it for now. If you did find any of that useful, hit that subscribe button now. And if you have any further questions, let me know in the comments below and I will get back to you. But anyway, that's it for now. I've been Craig Lopez. This has been Tutorialism. Peace.